Hey guys, welcome to my A-level physics revision video looking at the first part of the A-level module which is the structure of the atom. What happens if you cut a brick or just a chunk of matter in half infinitely many times? Could you do that an infinite number of times or would you get to a point where you get to this indivisible building block. And for ages, people thought that matter was actually, you couldn't get to a single building block. But actually it was shown right, I think it was in the early 1900s, that matter was in fact made of individual atoms. Normally we can represent atoms as spherical balls like here. They're not actually spherical balls, but it's handy at this point to represent them as such. And atoms were actually discovered to be incredibly, incredibly small, less than a tenth of a millionth of a millimetre in diameter. But it was then further discovered that atoms can be subdivided and that it's actually revealed that there was a structure inside the atom. Now you're probably aware of the structure already. It's the positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom and around the atom we've got these little guys here. These are the negatively charged electrons. I'm going to go for positive being red and negative being blue. So this is the general structure of the atom. But it was then found that the nucleus itself was actually comprised of subatomic particles. And these guys are collectively referred to as nucleons. So every so a nucleon is basically any particle that, that makes up an atomic nucleus. And the only two nucleons, they're actually only two different types, are the proton and this other guy here, which is the neutron. Also, the nucleus is made up of pr many protons and many neutrons, together referred to as nucleons, and around the nucleus are orbiting electrons. And this was the general picture devised by Ernest Rutherford in around about 1920. So you have the nucleus, which is often looked like this in most textbooks, and you've probably seen it before, uh, several different protons and several neutrons. So this is a typical nucleus. This would actually be lithium because it's got three protons in the nucleus, so third element down on the periodic table. And so therefore it would have three electrons. Now the arrangement of the electrons, you don't, that's more chemistry, you don't really need to know that for A-level physics. But I'll draw it anyway just for completeness. So, you have two electrons in the innermost shell and one electron in the outermost shell. Interesting to note that it's the electronic configuration of an atom is what determines its chemical properties, but the actual structure of the nucleus determines its physical nuclear properties. So, we now need to compare um, the different types of particles that make up the atom. And as you'll see that the proton and the neutron are fairly similar, but the electron is the one that's slightly different. Um, electrons are actually fundamental particles. However, protons and neutrons can actually be subdivided into quarks, but that's for a later video. So I'm now gonna draw out a table, and this table is gonna have each subatomic particle and you have to know gen all of the general properties of these three particles. So first one we're going to do is charge. Now I said earlier that the proton is positively charged. Neutron is of course electric electrically neutral, hence the name. And the electron is negatively charged. And the proton has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now it's plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs um, because of course it's positively charged. So the neutron of course we said is zero, so it would have zero coulombs. 
and the electron which is negatively charged we say has a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs so that's the charge of each individual particle that makes up the atom but what you can do is actually simplify it a bit and just say what's the relative charge so with the relative charge we're defining a charge of 1 to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and this is kind of what you might see a little bit more commonly in most textbooks rather than having to write out this long number you can just say that proton has a charge of 1 neutron 0 and the electron minus 1. The other property is the mass which you have to know and the masses of the proton and neutron are almost identical they're not quite the same neutron is slightly heavier than the proton but the proton and neutron are basically the same and so the proton has a mass of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms which of course is pretty damn small um, but of course this is atoms we're talking about so everything's going to be quite small um, and the neutron is likewise 1.6 times 10 to the minus 1.67 I should say actually you might need to know it to three, three significant figures normally and the electron is around about 1 2,000th of the mass at 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 so basically proton and neutron are almost identical electron around about 1 2,000th and so we can just say the relative mass, like we did with charge, proton and neutron defined to be 1, and the electron 1 over 2,000. These constants actually of 1.67 and 9.11, they will be given to you in the exam. So don't, you don't really need to worry about remembering them. So now I want to have a look at isotopes. Now, the definition of an isotope is a variant of an atom with the same proton number but a different neutron number so that's pretty much does what it says on the tin really and so say you have an atom most common example of this is carbon so you're gonna have six protons and we're gonna have six neutrons right there I might bother coloring it in because I'm a little bit lazy uh, so that would be what's known as carbon 12 um, but you can also have an identical, an almost identical nucleus, which has an extra neutron. Uh, and so this one here is actually called carbon-13. Uh, the 12 actually refers to the total number of protons and neutrons collectively. So this is carbon-12, and this is known as carbon-13. And another common one is carbon-14. So these three atoms are all isotopes of each other so an isotope is just that you know a different same proton number but different neutron number of course the type of element is determined by the proton number and so therefore you're not actually changing the proton number but you're changing the neutron number so you've got the same element basically now a little bit of notation right around here the proton number, for whatever reason, I have no idea why, we call Z. Don't know why, but it's a convention that we stuck to, so yeah. So just for an example, um, carbon has a proton number of Z equals 6, and uranium, which is the heaviest element, um, naturally occurring element, I should say, has a proton number of 92 so that's basically what uh, Z is it's just the simply the number of protons in the atoms nucleus the next one is of course the neutron number and that's given a much more sensible letter which is N stand for neutron makes sense <laughs> and so a common example carbon carbon 12 would have a neutron number of 6 Carbon-13 have a neutron number of 7, and carbon-14 just neutron number of 8. So basically that means it's got 8 neutrons in its nucleus, and because it's carbon, it has to have 6 protons. That's what, that's what makes it carbon. And the neutron number is called N, and the nucleon number, which 
is called A is pretty obvious. It's just the total number of neutrons and protons. So the, it's the number of nucleons. And that is pretty much a good correspondence for the weight of the atom. And because electrons are so light, so much lighter than protons and neutrons, nearly all of the mass of the atom just comes from the nucleus. And so therefore the nucleon number is almost like the mass number in, in chemistry. It's very, very slightly different because, of course, the electrons do have a tiny, tiny bit of mass. Now, we typically represent any type of atom or any sort of isotope of an atom by three, three components. So we have the X here. Now, this basically is the chemical symbol of the atom. You have the number of protons just to the bottom left of the chemical symbol and a, which is the nucleon number, to the top left of the chemical symbol. So just for an example, let's do carbon again, because carbon's a good example to choose. So carbon would be written as 12, 6, C. And that would be for carbon 12. For different isotopes, so say carbon 13, you'd have 13, 6, C, and 14, 6, C, for carbon-14. Uh, just another example that isn't carbon, let's go with uranium. So uranium actually has, has a very, very heavy nucleon number, 238. Chemical symbol of uranium is U, and it has 92 protons in its nucleus. So from that, you can actually determine how many neutrons are in it, which is 238 minus 92, which is 146. Um, so that's a typical question that you might get given. I now want to have a look at specific charge. Now, specific charge is defined as the charge per unit mass. And in that definition as a whole, we can basically just write pretty much almost what it is. So for charge, we use the symbol of Q uh, divided by the mass, which we use the symbol M. That is the specific charge. I don't think it has a symbol, so I'm just gonna write out specific charge. And I don't think I spelled specific right, but oh. So just for an example, let's calculate the specific charge of an electron. Now an electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And we're going to divide that by its mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And if you plug that into your calculator, you're going to get quite a big number. You'll get around about 1.8 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram, which is a pretty high number. So that's basically saying if you have a kilogram of electrons, then that will have a total charge of 1.8 times 10 to the minus 11 coulombs. So another example, uh, we'll do proton. Uh, which has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, as before. Note before I just took the magnitude of the charge. You don't actually have to worry too much about minus signs for this particular part. However, the mass is slightly different for a proton because, of course, it's heavier. So the mass of the proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And if we do that, we actually get a smaller specific charge of 9.58 times 10 to the 7 coulombs per kilogram. So even though you might not know the individual charge or mass, if you know the specific charge, you can still draw some conclusions. And from that, they actually discovered the electron. That's in the optional module, so you don't have to worry about that too much. I now want to have a look at the strong nuclear force. A big problem with the atomic model is, of course, if we have two protons that are in close proximity, then the electrostatic force between the protons should dictate that they're, they will fly apart. But of course that doesn't happen. We have a nucleus, and the nucleus is all bound together protons and neutrons. Neutrons, of course, don't have to worry about that because they're electrically neutral. But even so, 
the protons should technically be flying apart. So the question is, why don't they? And the answer to that is actually an entirely new force of nature. And when protons get close enough, then there is actually a very, very strong short range attraction between the two protons. And it's that force that actually binds the two protons together in the nucleus. And it's actually the battle between this, this force pushing them together and the electrostatic force that's pushing it apart that actually is responsible for radioactivity and radiation and things like that. But we'll have a look, look at that in nuclear physics. So what do we know about this force? Well, we know that it has to be very short range because, because at great distances, we know that they are going to repel each other and fly apart. So we know that this force can only work at a very short range. And this short range is typically about three or four femtometers. And one femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So it's very, 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 very short. And in comparison, the electrostatic force actually has an infinite range, albeit it dies down, but it does have a, a much longer range than this force. So what's the other thing we know about this force? Well, we know that in a nucleus, if the nucleus looks like this, we've got protons and we've got neutrons, we know that this force actually has the same effect on two protons as it does with a proton and a neutron. And indeed with two neutrons. So there's actually no, diff it doesn't matter what kind of particle it has, what, what particle it is, we know that it's exactly the same between all the nucleons. And the other, the final thing we know about this force is that it has to be repulsive. And that is because if we have two protons that are incredibly close together, then what is to stop them from just smashing into each other. There has to be some, some kind of force to stop that from happening. So at very, 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 very short range, then there is actually a bit of repulsion which actually stops them from smashing into each other. So we can actually draw a graph of this, of, of this, because we know how the, how the force acts. And so if we draw a graph, a bit like this, we know that the positive y-axis in this case uh, represents uh, repulsion. We know that at very, very, very short distances, and this, this along here is the distance, and that's the force. We know that at very short distances, we know it's repulsive, but at some point it becomes attractive, and then it dies off very, 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 very quickly, so that at any sort of significant distance, say, I don't know, 10 to the minus 10, around about here, it's virtually got no effect at all. And if we actually plot the electrostatic force on the same graph, uh, we can do something a bit like this. It will actually die down eventually, but of course it's got a much longer range um, than the strong nuclear force. And this force we refer to as the strong nuclear force. And it's an entirely new force of nature. It's responsible for binding the nucleus together. So I hope that helped and I'll see you in the next video.